next we have uh, Mr. Premium, uh, Jason Ganella, who is really kicking uh, some tail over with Van Wagner for uh, the Minnesota Vikings and a little bit of with the, the Atlanta Braves right now. But then before you've done college, you've done just about everything. So, uh, you know, realistically, yes. Mr. Premium is not just it. It's everything. Yeah. So thank you very much, Jason. All right. Thank you. Well, you guys will tell quickly, uh, I'm not much of a PowerPoint guy. I haven't done a whole lot of that. So um, this is pretty graphically unappealing. So hopefully the uh, presentation is a little bit more engaging um, than, uh, than, than the actual PowerPoint. Oh, OK, cool. Thanks. Um, well, hey, I, um, not, we, we tried to do this before um, when Amy was up here. And, and don't leave, Troy. Um, I think it's just tremendous that Troy was able to put this together in a really relatively short period of time. I've been going to a lot of these ALSDs uh, for a lot of, uh, which still sounds like a drug to me, but uh, I've been going to ALSD for a long time. Um, I think I counted up, I've been to uh, 14 of the 25, and I only started working in the industry, I think in 96 selling. Uh, so I've been to a few, and this is probably the most impactful from a content perspective, certainly a whole day. And uh, I think Troy and the guys that uh, put this together deserve a huge round of applause. So congratulations. So, um, so here, I'm, Troy had asked me to come up and, uh, or be a part of this to talk a little bit about uh, premium sales and um, got me into, uh, got me this morning when I came down and, and really wanted me to talk about uh, the transition from ticket sales into premium sales. And um, I think I can add some insight into that and I'll try to leave it open-ended. And uh, the nice thing uh, about going last is I get to steal a lot of things from other people. And uh, I was sat in the back here today and uh, was really uh, quite impressed with the lineup of speakers. So um, I'm waiting for somebody to change, change this and I actually have the clicker man. Um, so I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the concept of premium sales. How many people in here actually sell premium right now? OK. Um, so there's probably more premium sellers in here than we actually thought about. Uh, um, but uh, what I'm going to talk about is a little bit about sales process um, and some key attributes and traits. We spent a lot of time today talking about data and uh, really cool tools, and, and uh, Phil certainly spent some time on some really cool things that uh, are certainly worth exploring that, that we don't do a lot of in Minnesota or Atlanta. Um, so I think the key to uh, effective selling, uh, just generally speaking, um, it, and, and I think it's uh, super personified and super magnified it, once you get into the premium space is asking questions. Uh, it sounds sort of counterintuitive, and um, I was joking uh, to myself, I think, in the back when they were talking about a five-star lead versus a one-star lead and how you would treat it differently. And I think in a lot of cases, um, a lot of folks, once they get in or graduate into premium selling, uh, they get into this situation where there's so many great things about the product, the product's really expensive, uh, almost everybody that's selling premium, unless you're coming from sponsorship sales down into premium, uh, this is the most expensive sale uh, in many cases that they've ever been a part of. Uh, so there's this tend to, tendency to over talk. Uh, there's this tendency to, you know, I've got to get to the 15th benefit in the benefit sheet. Uh, and if I don't get to that point, there's no way I'm going to possibly close the sale. And I think it's actually the exact opposite. Um, and I think if, if, you, if you take some time introspectively, and look at people uh, personally that you admire or folks that uh, do really well within your organization or in your past career, uh, most of those folks are really good and comfortable. Um, I think it was Dove used to have that, that commercial for their men's soap, you know, I'm comfortable in my own skin, um, are comfortable asking questions. Kind of, I, I use the analogy or, or the metaphor of uh, let the game come to you, right? If you ask simple questions, um, you ask people for help, uh, you ask people to uh, tell you a little bit about their current situation. Um, I think it's, it's very impactful to the process. It'll put you in a better position. So um, simple questions which sound uh, sort of cumbersome at first and it'll let people open up and let them sort of take over. Um, the vast majority of people that we deal with, especially folks, I, 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 I tend to work on new buildings, uh, which are at least initially somewhat easier sales. Um, than uh, you know buildings that have been open for a while. 
Um, but once you get to a certain point in any sort of sales process, uh, you're going to get to those customers that are kind of in between and are probably maybe looking at something that's overspending. There's not a lot of folks that uh, are necessarily thinking about or looking to purchase premium inventory um, when they come down to take a look at things. There's, you know, very rarely do you get a, a, a call. Uh, uh, a call off the you know the queue line or the hunt line or whatever you call it in your organization where someone's looking to purchase a suite. So these, these are usually sales that need to be nurtured, uh, sales that need to be, um, they take a little bit of time and I think asking questions, uh, especially simple ones, are, are, are very important. Um, Al spent a lot of time, uh, as did uh, the guys from the Niners, Paul Epstein and those guys, about the cold call and uh, that sort of going the way of the, uh, of the dinosaur, kind of get, becoming extinct. Um, and I'll get to this a little bit later in the presentation, but um, I think the mentality of the cold call and, and all these different tools uh, that different people spoke about today um, is, it, are, are, are very helpful and getting someone on the phone live, uh, especially someone at you know, Al's level, um, is, is not an easy thing to do, especially on one call. There's the idea of the one call close. Um, but the mentality of the phone call and having to do the research and the due diligence is critical um, to all this. And I, I think the next point, um, you know, get to know who you're talking to was something that Al really brought up. You know, you talk about, um, especially in San Francisco, a lot of those tickets were really expensive, um, just general tickets. But you start to get into these suites, you're asking for people, you know, even if it's a two or uh, any kind of multi-year commitment, it's you know hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not close to a million dollars in terms of commitment. Um, you've got to act um, and, and have your stuff together, if you will, uh, pretty early on in the process. So the research you do on the front end, it, while it may not be a cold call or, or the chase, you have to have that mentality that you're going to be prepared. You know, What does the firm do? What does the person that you're trying to call do uh, at the firm? Um, and then one of the key questions, uh, I think, or, or one of the key answers to glean out is, what is success for that customer, right? So if you get them talking about all these different things, it's going to put you in a much more, um, uh, a much better, excuse me, uh, position to then um, put them in a solution where you're driving them towards a successful outcome, right? So asking the questions, um, getting your information together, and really the key is to listen, 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 listen. We've got a few folks, um, and this has happened on every staff I've ever worked with, and I've worked with a few, is you've got these people that sort of talk over folks, right? They've got all the aggressiveness down um, and all the attributes to be really successful, but they don't spend the time listening. And it's, a, it's something you really have to train into people is, is the art of listening, and it's a, I, I think it's really a lost art in sales these days. So I think another key nuance of this, and this isn't, you know, rocket science and uh, you know I, I don't have a lot of cool uh, applications and different things to talk about here. Uh, but I think a big differentiation point for folks that are successful in the premium space, and this is way more critical than anything on the ticket sales side of things, um, is likability. Um, what we're selling in the premium space is probably the largest unbudgeted item that's sold consistently in sports, right? If you look at what our corporate seller uh, brethren have to sell with, they're selling to big companies that have marketing budgets and their jobs are on the line, the person on the other end of the phone or the person in the other end of the meeting uh, to drive market share. Um, just think about the pressure that we put on personally. I mean, we're, we're dealing with this right now in Minnesota uh, with the Vikings uh, marketing team uh, about getting the word out that we actually have seat licenses to sell. You know, there's, there's a concern in the marketplace, or a concern on our staff side that there's not enough awareness in the marketplace that we're actually on sale. So when you're picking up the phone to call the two, if there, uh, well, there's definitely two, but maybe three or four options in the soft drink category, the chances are fairly high they're gonna be able to do some kind of a deal with the soft drink deal. It might not be as big as the deal was 10 years ago. It might not be as big as the deal was two years ago. Um, but there's someone in the soft drink category, or maybe the beer category is better. And those categories change over time, but there's, there's typically buyers there. There's not many people, and, uh, oh, sorry. What the hell did I do? Maybe that's a good thing. 
Oh, wow. I've never done that before. Sorry. I think I pressed one of the bottom ones. Anyway, um, sorry about that. The, uh, the point I was trying to make there was um, there, there's really not a lot of people, and, and Bill's tried to do this and has done it fairly successfully. I think this is the fourth year he's put this buyer's conference together. Um, yeah, I want to go back one, one more or two more. Here, I can do that now, I think. Oh, there we go. There we go. Um, putting together this, uh, this, this, this conference, the CTIC, where he actually puts buyers together to talk about their strategies and different things. Um, you don't have a lot of strategies like that. There's, there's not a ton of, uh, you know, we've all done customer events and trips and things like that uh, in the premium space, but they don't have, you know, sweet holder summits. I mean, this Bill's, uh, Bill Dorsey's thing that he, he put together a few years ago uh, was the first of its kind where he actually had buyers together talking about how they spend their money, how do they leverage their tickets, and all those different things. So um, I, I would argue that, and not just because I've done it and have been okay at it over time, but um, I would argue that the premium side of the business is probably the most difficult sale that's out there because there's, you've got to educate the buyer with what the product is. I mean, there's you know, this whole differential that you know, we want to create the idea that there's, there's no inventory available because that really helps us when in, in reality, a lot of us are struggling to keep our buildings full. So it's, a, it's kind of this delicate balance, right? So the, the ability for the, for the sales rep uh, or the capability of the sales rep to be likable, I think is a, is a very critical uh, you know, dynamic in this whole thing because you, you really don't have budgets that need to be made. Uh, if you've got a marketing person that isn't spending their advertising budget, which goes back to corporate sales, there's probably a fairly high likelihood that they don't have a job over time. And then same thing on the ticket side, right? You've got, you know, general fans, you know, people have budgets to go out and do things, different things like that. The idea of the suites, it's usually a non, uh, or, or a premium product is really not a non-budgeted uh, enterprise and it's really expensive, right? So um, the way I think that you could be likable or, or uh, that I've had success being likable or most people that we do business with uh, seem to like me and, and, and the people that work for me that are successful is if you're solution based, right? So if you're asking the right kind of questions, you're driving towards a solution. And there's been a lot of discussion about that today. I think Amy uh, had, a, had a good point there about being solution based. I screwed up again, I'm sorry. I think it's, uh, maybe I'm hitting the mic thing or whatever. Um, so if you're, if you're uh, you know, driving towards a solution, it's gonna be easier for folks to like, you know, you, you to be likable. And then maybe I'll put it in my left hand. There we go. Um, so b by being solution based, you're working to understand needs, uh, what the success is for the client, like I talked about on the last slide, build a common ground, peers in the industry. Um, someone talked about um, th this concept of, you know, don't tell a C, don't, you know, as a, as a 25 or even me, 43 year old guy that's, I ran my own company for a little while, it wasn't all that successful. Um, but. Uh, you know, don't, don't go in there and tell a CEO how to make a decision. Walk down a parallel path, right? Um, talk about examples of different things and, and, and uh, you know, different folks that are using the product that you're trying to sell the way you're trying to get them to use it. But again, if you're asking the right questions, you're gleaning that own information, you're kind of guiding this person down a path, which ultimately is gonna be successful for you, right? They're telling you what they need to do to be successful, and all you're doing is offering up solutions to drive them to that success. Um, the, other, the other point, sort of in that last, uh, that last little dash there, comfort with options, right? The idea uh, being, and, and especially in these older buildings now, is that it's, we're almost building products to, to meet needs uh, for the client. So, so driving towards, it's not one size fits all, and I think this is, again, especially true in premium, uh, comparatively to tickets and different other options. Um, that we have out there, but trying to drive to a point where you've got, um, you know, a variety of options and, and getting folks uh, comfortable with what those options are. And I think the biggest benefit and uh, biggest attribute our products have is, is this access to benefits and general access to access, if you will. You know, uh, you can get people down on the field, you can get people down on the court, there's road trips, there's all these different things. And, and being able to, 
uh, put people in that um, situation where they can be really um, uh, able to access things that they're not able to access if they're not part of this elite club, right? So um, the other final concept is, is, is using value as an asset as well, right? So you've got um, a lot of these products are bundled. Uh, the access to concerts, the access to special events, all the different things that we have access to, um, and, and making sure that we're leveraging that to the uh, to the other, you know, to the client in a in a in a way that um, wow, this is going to be cool to do business with Jason, or this is going to be cool to do business with, you know, what, whoever you're representing. Um, one other point I didn't put up there, uh, which I think is also very instrumental um, to success right now, is also leveraging sort of the business play. Uh, of being associated with the organization you're representing for their business. Um, you know, so we, we did this a lot when I was at AEG, um, and I think it's, you know, an essential sort of building block of what it is we do. And I'm going to talk about this here in a second, about this idea of managing up. But getting into, you know, how your organization's spending money um, and, and how you could possibly leverage those opportunities to spend money against your customer base. It's, it's a really difficult market out there right now. Um, there's a lot of pressure on these budgets and different places that folks uh, go to get money for these premium products uh, that we are all charged to sell or if you're lucky enough to be in premium or unlucky enough to be in premium. Um, and, uh, you know, leveraging the uh, business opportunities against the, uh, the, uh, the, um, the cost of these products is, is pretty impactful as well. So... Um, one, one other sort of key thing I want to bring to the table today, uh, and as someone that, you know, manages teams uh, of sellers, um, the key to upselling or selling up, uh, or there's two different things, right? You want to walk people up the ladder, which is one component of upselling. And I think the other, another dynamic that's important to talk about here, especially with uh, folks that are on the front line, is working within your organization to get people that are in a position to enact change um, to product offering, enact change to what the market is saying and different things. And, and we talked about this a little bit um, in an earlier presentation. Uh, I forget which, uh, which person it was that was talking about it, about what was driving people's day, right? Um, I would love to sit here as a guy that manages a 20-some person team in Minnesota has some responsibility down in Atlanta that my day is completely uh, predicated and dedicated to the people that work for me, and that's just not reality, right? So there's things that I miss unless someone comes to me and says, hey, this is a problem, we're not hitting this or we're not hitting that, and we need to change directions. So I would say as someone that manages people, and your manager should appreciate this, and if they don't, you should probably be out looking for another job. Um, but you should be able and, and feel empowered if you're seeing trends that whatever it is you're selling uh, or whatever it is you're messaging isn't meeting that uh, the the marketplace generally where you think it should be you know matching up and you've got some issues then it's time to sit down and that's you know that's really what your staff meetings, that's really what your sort of one-on-ones with your bosses or whatever it is should really be about. So the idea of upselling is, I think, a two-way street. It's not just upselling the client, but also selling up internally and making sure that that product offering is, uh, it, you know, is, is being changed and that, that information is being communicated effectively up the food chain. So one of the keys to the other side of upselling or selling up uh, is getting that person that's a ticket buyer uh, or a casual buyer of a ticket, a secondary buyer, whatever, uh, into the proper channel. Uh, so your premium reps, or in your case, you individually, uh, can get to that buyer to, to actually sell. And this is something from a uh, personal perspective, and I think corporately, um, now within Van Wagner, is becoming sort of our mantra, is the idea of conversion versus selling new. And in the projects that we're working on right now in the two markets, um, both in Atlanta and in, in, in uh, Minnesota, is that we're finding that if approached properly, the conversion buyer or the person that's already in-house, which intuitively makes a lot of sense, right? 
that's your most likely buyer for premium. That's your most likely buyer to step up and buy club seats. And it's happened in the early, we've been on sale for about 45 days in Atlanta, um, maybe a little less than that. And uh, we've been on sale for about 16 months in Minnesota. And what we found was with good success was that people that we could identify uh, through a variety of channels um, that we could get to that were already existing Vikings customers in Minnesota, Braves customers in Atlanta, getting those to, folks to the proper point was pretty um, impactful for us and we were able to sell um, a lot of our most expensive product uh, to, to those customers early on in the process, which was, which was pretty gratifying and uh, effective to, uh, to our sales process. Um, I talked a little bit about the, the general offering and the communicate up. So, let's see if I can do this right. There we go. Um, and then I think from a final sort of talking point, and this got back to the uh, um, idea of uh, the cold calling and, um, you know, I, I've known Al for a long time and to hear Al and, um, you know, knowing Paul a little bit from my time in California, um, I, I can't sort of uh, overstate how uh, outer body it was to, to hear them talk about the cold call being extinct uh, as, as guys that I know uh, were big phone call guys. Um, but I, I've got two examples in the room here um, of guys that work for me now that all started on inside sales teams, or both started on inside sales teams for me, ironically, in the same place. And I think the key attributes of success in sales are consistent from the inside phone room all the way through to your best premium sellers. And it's a work hard, work smart. Um, I thought it was cool that Rob you know, said that he wasn't a guy that put in a you know, the longest day, um, and, and I wasn't either when I was in the front line. Uh, but I was, I, I prided myself, and I think as Rob said as well, Rob signed that, um, you know, working smart was just important to working hard. But at the end of the day, the smart guy, or the, the work smart guy is also working hard as well. And that's really a key thing in, in, in premium. Um, I, I mean, a lot of people mention this too, there's not really a magic bullet or a magic potion to any of this stuff. And a lot of it really gets down to hard work. So. You're going to have to put the time in. You're going to have to make calls. You're going to have to make connections. Um, as glitzy and glamorous as premium sales is, you're still going to have to get in touch with people and get them to part with their cash, which is, uh, you know, sometimes easier, sometimes harder. Um, but I, I think a lot of those, you know, critical building blocks um, that are so important in the early stages or the uh, early stages of your sales career are going to come through. Um, here in premium as well. Um, one thing to keep in mind, and I mentioned this earlier, you know, the premium sales process, I think is, could be, or it's not, if it's not the uh, longest uh, process from start to finish in sports. I mean, again, going back to corporate sales, which may, um, you know, on average be bigger deals. Um, if your beer category comes up, I mean, that, that whole process you know, give or take when it actually comes up. I mean, that could take a matter of weeks. We're in essence from start to finish to get to someone from uh, the idea of, you know, purchasing a single event suite or some club seats or something like that, all the way up to a long-term contract or whatever, you know, could take a year or so to, to actually complete. So I think the stick to itiveness and, and again, that work hard mentality is gonna be critical to uh, uh, the success of the successful seller. Um, I think also targeting, um, I thought the uh, idea, one of the big takeaways I had today was uh, the idea of uh, breaking up industries and selling like industries. I mean, I remember when Hoover's first came out years ago, um, you know, talking about competitive firms and using that intelligence. I think in the premium space, the idea of uh, talking about peer level firms uh, amongst each other is a, is a powerful tool. And, uh, you know, again, it, it really comes down to hard work. And um, for me, uh, you know, we're outworking uh, your in-market competition and, you know, being the best at what you do and making sure that folks, again, back to the LinkedIn model or, or however you're communicating this to people, that whoever you're representing, um, 
there's a fair amount of people in the marketplace that know you're the proper person or collectively the team you're working with are the proper people to talk to about getting engaged with those teams. So again, not real rocket science stuff, but uh, you know, just some, just some key attributes uh, and, 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 and some small nuances that uh, hopefully will lead to success as it seems like a lot of you are already in this, the premium space, but uh, some little nuggets I thought that would be helpful uh, to share here. So I think that's, that is the last slide. So um, I don't know uh, if anybody has any questions or anything, uh, but I'd be happy to answer that. I think we have a, a, a few more minutes if, uh, in between uh, presentations. Okay, so, uh, well, did you have oh, one? Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's certainly, um, it's certainly delicate in, in all the markets I've ever worked in. Um, in addition to working at Van Wagner, um, I've done this in a couple of other markets in this type of situation. Um, typically speaking, I mean, you're, a group like ours is being brought in, um, for a variety of reasons. Um, one of which may be you know, the task at hand from the marketing folks that are there, they either want their current people charged with doing something different or, you know, there's some level of, you know, we, we need an outside group to get us there or whatever the dynamic is. Um, so yeah, the short answer to that is, it, it is it's a very delicate sort of process. I think um, we've been fairly successful um, in, in the approach that, the, and this is true on uh, the other parts of our business, not just the premium side, but that the folks in market have the best relationships with the customers that they already have, um, and, and, and possibly those that they don't have, uh, but a fresh um, sort of take on the ones that they don't have, so customers that aren't already spending money with them uh, is probably, we're the best charge to do that. Uh, and then we work collaboratively with the existing group. Um, the two groups that we're working with um, now, the Vikings and the Braves, both had very small staffs to begin with. Uh, so they had one or two people within a group that were managing their existing premium, especially in the suite area. Um, so it was all additive from that perspective. You know, they just didn't have enough market coverage or whatever. Uh, but the, the idea of how you're approaching their existing customers is a pretty, pretty delicate process and you know is, is you know where the question came from so it's um, you know we, we have a pretty experienced approach and I mean just like um, you know what I was talking about about how you're approaching the actual end user of the suite um, same sort of situation like there's a lot of things that sound similar or look similar to other things that you've experienced but at the end of the day there might be nuances to every little client situation and, and it's, it's, it's important to have that sort of team um, or have that team approach to, to kind of help manage through that process. So. Okay. Um, sure. Everybody likes the idea of owning club seats or owning a suite or doing all these fun different things. Um, you know, when you're working just on selling season tickets, then oftentimes the, the, the cycle, the sales cycle is gonna be, you know, hopefully that first meeting or upwards of like you know, a month. Right, 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 right. You know, um, at what point, knowing that this is what sort of key indicators do you use to kind of lead out to somebody who's just been milking you along for, you know, four months, six months, a year, however long it may be? Yeah, I mean, um, I, I think, again, not to, the, the world doesn't just revolve around questions. I mean, but it, it, a lot of it has to do with your um, sort of approach in terms of what's, uh, you know, tactical from the perspective of, um, you know, asking the right kind of questions of if I can get you, to us, you know, um, try, uh, try, let me think of a quick example that'd be easy to explain without taking a whole lot of time. So, you know, if I'm asking you the right kind of questions, if I can get you to a certain point where you can manage this type of an investment, get you this type of return, yeah, you've answered all the objections and then you've got them set at the right point. I mean, it sounds, sounds easy on paper, right? Um, but that's really, that's really the key approach. I mean, um, Right. 
Yeah, and the reality is I think you just have to cut bait at that point, right? right? Yeah, it doesn't sound like this is something you want to do, and you know, you, then you, it's where you sort of take control back over and you kind of move on to the next thing. I mean, it's, uh, I think it was Rob's thing, you know, you can, we can all live in the world of hope or maybe. If they're not going to buy, they're not going to buy. You just kind of move on to the next thing. So. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Premium. Oh, thank, thank you very you. much.